I grew up kind of as a single child of two older brothers, much older than I am. Didn't really do a lot of the boy things boys did. Never was involved in sports. Um, uh, growing up in elementary and junior high, uh, definitely was overweight, not that attractive kid. Always was made fun of. Um, and also was also very feminine growing up. Uh, a lot of people in school calling me names, calling me faggot and all that, uh, fat faggot and really, really adding the, the pain into that. But it wasn't until I was probably about 12 or 13 when I actually first got saved. That is just when I first met the love of my life, which was Jesus. That's when I first met him. And it was such a tangible experience. I remember, um, that day, every thought was so pure, every feeling was so clean, and I remember even trying to cuss, trying to prove, trying to prove, you know, I'm going to see if I can say a cuss word, and I couldn't, I couldn't. You, you, you couldn't take away my tangible experience that day that, that God, when it, the G, I invited Jesus into my life, and Jesus was my Lord. But the homosexual tendencies and, and the, um, the lust and all that that was starting to involve in my life com immediately pulled me back away from that tangible experience. When I was about 18 or so, I met um, somebody at a store and it was the first time that I had actually had a quick encounter with another homosexual, if you will, at the time. And uh, there, was, there was some attraction between one another and uh, I had the boldness somehow to give him my, my number at the time. And he invited me to a club. And I'll never forget standing at that dance floor and looking at all the people and I had an overwhelming sense of, I'm okay, they're just like me. They, they like guys too, they're guys that like guys, they're just like me, I'm okay, this is okay. And at that moment is when it, it was game on. It was full-fledged homosexual lifestyle, loud and proud, wearing the gay shirts, going to the gay pride parades, uh, just um, starting to go to all the clubs at every hours that they were open, trying to meet as many people as I could, and also trying to find love and trying to find that relationship that I felt like that I needed. I had lots of homosexual relationships lots of homosexual sexual encounters with, may I be frank, people I didn't even know their name. So once I had met this gentleman and had and decided this was someone who I could have that long-term relationship with. When you are in a relationship with someone who's HIV positive, it's very customary to get tested every three months or so. So I had done my testing religiously every three months, always came back negative. So it was time for my testing again. And the doctor called and said, I'd like for you to come into the office. Great, no problem. She sat me down and my partner was with me. And she said, I hate to tell you this, but your, your test has come out positive. That was the defining moment in my life. And I, out of nowhere, I heard the voice of God for the first time in my life. And he said, can't you see, this is not the life I had for you. And that day was the absolute defining moment of when my, the tracks were shifted in my life. And when we were going this way, God completely interrupted and went this way. And here's the most miraculous thing about that. I was not searching after God. I was living loud and proud, sleeping with all these guys, loving all the clubbing, loving, living, living the high life and the and and lust and sex and, and all that. No, I was not looking for God. And here he comes out of the blue and speaks to me in the middle of the doctor's office and says, Can't you see this is not the life I had for you? If that's not mercy and grace, I I I, I don't know what is. I, I don't that is the absolute utter depiction of mercy and grace. And so that began a journey of God starting to reel me out of that lifestyle. I began to read the Bible. I began to develop my relationship with the Lord, go to church anytime the doors were open. And the Lord really started speaking to me that he did not create me to be homosexual. I was not created to be that. 
And I'll never forget the time when I was at my place of work, a gentleman came in and he was patting and holding his three-year-old boy. And he was patting him and kissing him and patting him and kissing him. And I remember serving him and I remember thinking, oh, that's, that's so sweet. I always loving this little boy. And voice of God came right back in at that moment and said, your father never did that to you. And the Lord spoke to me and said, Russell, there is a, a root that bears the fruit. And he was revealing to me that the root of never getting over the hurt of losing my father was bearing the fruit of same-sex attraction and pressing down the masculinity and, and allowing the enemy to deceive me into thinking, oh no, you're born gay, you feel this and you feel that, and you like that guy and you like this guy. And, and that is when God began to rip the sheets off the lies of the enemy and began to just really reveal to me, this is not what I created you for. God was just unbrooding and truth was coming in and lies were being squeezed out. And I remember telling him, God, I want everything restored. I don't want to just not like guys anymore. I don't want to just um, not be attracted to men. I, I want the full redemption. I want my masculinity back. I want my heterosexuality back. I, I want the limp wrist to go. I, I want those things. I want the voice to go deeper. Um, and, and I confess for years over my life, thank you, Father, that people will look at me and they'll never be able to tell where I came from. As I'm walking with the Lord and walking out healing, I always knew God was a healer. Read Mark chapter two, where Jesus is in um, Peter's house, I believe. And there were so many people there that no one could get in. But the, but the four men carried the paralytic there and cut a hole in the roof. And what did Jesus say? He said, and here's the amplified version, son, your sins have been forgiven, that is, the penalty remitted, righteousness bestowed, and you've been made upright and right standing with God. I knew God was showing me HIV was a penalty. And I had been forgiven. Not just forgiven of sin. Because the world will forgive what you do, but might not necessarily forget or let you off the hook, if you will. But that's not the God kind of forgiveness. The God kind of forgiveness is, not only do I forgive you of the sin, but I remit the penalty. Why would you go to jail if you were declared not guilty? If you're not guilty, there is no jail sentence. HIV is a jail sentence. And God was showing me, I forgave you, and it is as if you've never slept with any guy. It is as if you never had premarital sex. So therefore, HIV has no legal right to attach itself to your body. And at that moment, I knew God was revealing to me that forgiveness and healing go hand in hand. So the Lord really started to restore my heterosexuality, my masculinity. I had a lot of friends in church. I had one very best friend, Carrie, and she was always there, always my go-to. And definitely attraction was building on and off through the many years we were friends, but there was never really a peace or a, or a, a green light, if you will, to, to date um, until one day we were on the phone and she just sounded so different to me. And I said, Lord, she sounded so different over the phone. What was that? And God spoke so clearly and said, oh, she's stepping into her position as a wife. And I went, wow, whose wife? Wow, actually took about two weeks for that to kind of settle in. And I thought, Lord, you really are revealing that it's I can pursue her. And so not two weeks later, I asked her out on a date. And she said, yes. And when she said, yes, I'm oh, the Lord spoke to her too. And we dated for a year. A year later, we got married. And we have a six-year-old daughter and we have a two-year-old boy. And then when our son was born, she had to get blood work again. You know, they test the usual stuff. And I was holding the blood results. I was holding the paperwork that she had to give to the lab tech. And sure enough, I saw HIV right there written in the, the list of things to get tested. And I said, hmm, look at that. They test for HIV. She goes, yeah, I know. And sure enough, when next two weeks later, we walk into the doctor's office to get the test results and do more baby checkups, the doctor goes, 
everything looks great. And I said, really? Everything? She goes, yep. Your blood work looks great. Really? How about that? I never once doubted God that he would give me a wife to get infected. God wouldn't, wouldn't speak into my life and release a wife if I wasn't healed of HIV and she had danger of being infected, and especially my children, my, my blood-bought children. Oh my gosh, what a horrible thought. But I knew, I knew God loved me. I knew God loved my wife. I knew our marriage was a match made in heaven, literally. And I knew that I could trust that. I was standing on the street corner a slave in ragged clothes, shackled in chains with bondage, lust, loneliness, unforgiveness, hurt, pain. And Satan stood on the corner and says, slaves for sale, slaves for sale. But then came a man down that dark alley and said, I'll take that one. And he said, I'll take Russell. I turned and looked and said, he knows my name. And Satan said, no, this one comes with a price. And Jesus said, I already paid the price. Satan had no choice but to loose the shackles and loose the chains. And as Jesus carried me off the corner and down the street, he gave me his rope, his ring, and he led me into the way everlasting. That is my story.